I don't know what was driving me, but I needed to prove myself from the day I was born. I always kind of considered myself a fluke because there were no others like me. Barbie, you're beautiful. You make me feel my Barbie doll is really Hello doll fans and welcome back to Beauty Inside a Box. My name is Joey and today we are talking about Ruth Handler, the trailblazing businesswoman who created the DING Barbie doll and she co-founded Mattel. Ruth Handler had a crazy, crazy life with really high highs and really low lows and we are going to talk about all of it today in this video. Some of you may know of Ruth Handler because the mum from Matilda plays her in the Barbie movie. Her ghost is haunting the Mattel headquarters. It really is a shame that Ruth didn't live to see the Barbie movie, see her creation up on the big screen, but she still got to experience loads of Barbie's historic, iconic moments. Don't forget doll fans, if you love dolls as much as I do, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and check me out on Instagram and TikTok. But anyway, let's talk about the mother of Barbie, Ruth Handler. Ruth Handler was born on November 4th, 1916 in Denver, Colorado. Wasn't she so cute? She's actually the most adorable child. Anyway, she was the youngest of 10 children. That's a big household. And surprisingly, Ruth never liked playing with dolls as a child. Ruth was always very driven and had a constant desire to prove herself. I'm not surprised that she feels the need to prove herself when she's the youngest of 10. You must be fighting for attention the whole time. But she was also very likeable and charismatic. She started dating Elliot Handler, who she met at a charity ball when she was just 16. Later on, Ruth went on a trip to Los Angeles and loved it so much that she ended up living there. And Elliot soon came to join her. Ruth worked at Paramount while Elliot worked and also went to art school. In 1938, they got married and they soon had two children called Barbara and Kenneth. Do you recognize those names? <laughs> but Ruth very quickly grew bored of being a stay-at-home wife. I loved my children, but I wasn't suited to taking care of a home. One Sunday, Ruth and Elliot visited Elliot's old friend and co-worker, Harold Matson, and the three of them decided to go into business together. The name Mattel was a combination of Matson and Elliot. Elliot said in interviews that the name Ruth just didn't really fit. We formed a company called Mattel. It was Harold Matson and Elliot Handler. It, we tried to put Ruth in there, but somehow it didn't fit. Or Rumat or something like that didn't go together. M Ruth L. Ma Matuf? M -L no. Although Ruth has said that it never really occurred to them to put her name in, but she never really cared. Elliot had experience making furniture, so they decided to make picture frames and other little trinkets. Ruth would go out and handle the business and the contracts with the clients. At the time, it was very uncommon for women to be involved in the business in this way. But Ruth had been part of the business from the very start. In 1945, they originally started working out of the garage in the Handler's apartment building, but the other occupants were getting frustrated at their cars constantly being dusted with little bits of wood and plastic. So the Mattel company moved to a little workshop and the workshop would cost $50 to rent for six months, which for today's standards is ridiculously cheap. <laughs> Sadly, the garage that they originally started working out of doesn't exist anymore because it was demolished when a nearby boulevard was widened. Very early on, Matson sold his shares and stake to the handlers due to poor health. The following year, Ruth took over his stake. I bet he ended up regretting selling his shares <laughs> because Mattel would become such a massive success. Ruth eventually landed a large order at a major photography studio. After they had completed the order, they had loads of scrap wood left over, which they decided to use to make doll's house furniture. Here you can see the little chairs they made. They obviously incorporated some plastic as well. The doll's house furniture turned out to be really popular, so Mattel shifted their focus to making toys. 
In this toy factory, millions of toys are made. Toys like these honey bears. Musical clocks. Toy guitars. And merry-go-rounds. Their first success came in 1947 with a ukulele called the Yukadoodle. <laughs> Interesting. In 1955, Walt Disney would approach the Mattel company and ask them to sponsor his brand new show, The Mickey Mouse Club. Crazy to think that Mattel and Disney have had a relationship since 1955. That's a long time. Disney offered them 15 minutes of commercial time a week for $500,000. $500,000 was just about the value of their company at the time. So this was a very, very risky deal. It basically had to succeed, or this would mean the end of Mattel. Even though it was so risky, Mattel accepted the offer. Advertising toys on TV was a very new and mostly unexplored concept at the time, but it paid off. The Mickey Mouse Club was a massive hit, and Mattel increased its sales by 25%. Meanwhile, in the late 1950s, Ruth observed her daughter playing with paper dolls. These dolls looked like teenagers and adults, and Barbara would act out aspirational stories about being a teenager and going to parties and stuff like that. I had observed my daughter Barbara playing with her friends on the floor by the hour. They would play with uh, adult paper dolls. This is what you, kind of stuff you were playing with, Debbie Reynolds. And the, oh boy, that's a neat one. Then, of course, Ruth had the idea, what if we could make a three-dimensional version of these paper dolls, a teen fashion doll? I tried to convince Elliot that we could make a three-dimensional uh, doll to, and create such play patterns and he said it'd be impossible for us to do. At the time, as is well documented at the very beginning of the Barbie movie, most of the dolls on the market were only baby dolls and other dolls which would encourage the child to play out maternal nurturing roles. Ideal Toys, one of Mattel's competitors, did have a couple of dolls that were sort of like fashion dolls that were out at the time. For example, Miss Revlon. I made a whole video about the dolls of the 1950s. If you want to have a deeper look into the other fashion dolls that were available before Barbie. But Miss Revlon's popularity was very short-lived. And also, she didn't really look like an adult. She looked more like a 12-year-old. And most importantly, she didn't have breasts. Ruth was insistent that their fashion doll would look like a grown-up and therefore would have breasts. Why was it important to you that this doll have breasts? The whole idea was that a little girl could uh, dream dreams of growing up, and every grown-up that she uh, saw had breasts. But the men in the company really didn't like this idea. They thought it would be weird and creepy to make a doll with breasts to give to children. So the idea was shelved. But Ruth remained determined to make her adult doll with breasts. <laughs> a while later, the handlers were on a trip around Europe when Ruth saw a fashion doll in the window of a German shop. The doll was called Build Lily. She was based on a racy, kind of suggestive comic strip character from the Build newspaper. And the doll was originally made to be a novelty gift for adults. But the doll had interestingly become quite popular with German children. Ruth used Build Lily as an example of how a adult fashion doll could be a success. Uh, Wait a second, had you gotten past the breast issue with these guys? They were. They oh, I, by now I was in command. <laughs> so you were, you went and said, well, do and my, this thing, uh, and they went, well, yes, ma'am. Well, not quite like that. My husband really had it all design activity, and by the time we had bought that doll, I had already convinced him to. Oh, okay. He he now saw. It the light. We gave up and we lost our resistance to everything. So the men in the company reluctantly agreed to make Ruth's fashion doll. Now the next thing they had to decide was the name. And Ruth has said many times that there was only ever one name for the doll. Question, what about a name? 
Well, the name, it just never could have been anything except Barbie. Why because, not? Oh, well, the inspiration for the doll came from observing my own daughter Barbara play. Did you call your daughter Barbie? I called my daughter Babs and Babsy and Barbie and Barb. <laughs> all those things. And so did you I go down to the copyright office and put Babs, Barbsy, Barb? Tried and them all, and the one that we were able to get was Barbie. While making the Barbie doll, Mattel moved production to Japan for the first time so that they could make the Barbie doll with as much detail as possible, but for as little cost as possible. Zippers that really work. Rich satin lining. Matched accessories in minutest detail. Perfect workmanship in every beautiful costume. The Barbie doll would end up costing $1.50 wholesale and then $3 retail. When performing market research, Mattel found that a lot of mothers were jealous of the Barbie doll. Yes, they are jealous of a piece of plastic. Some jokingly called her Daddy's doll because they thought she looked too sexy. <laughs> So Mattel shifted their marketing strategy to promote Barbie as a teaching tool to educate young girls about proper grooming and grace. If you were Barbie, the glamorous teenage fashion model doll by Mattel, you would have a fabulous wardrobe created for you by Mattel's famous designers. Like this spectacular form-fitted evening gown, handcrafted with exquisite detailing most elegant style. Only Barbie has such a magnificent wardrobe. When creating the Barbie doll, Ruth was met with resistance at pretty much every stage of development. When Mattel debuted the doll at the 1959 Toy Fair, most retailers were uninterested. But when she went on sale, mothers and daughters were very interested, and she was flying off the shelves. Especially after the doll was advertised during the Mickey Mouse Club, retailers were desperate to restock the doll to meet demand. We were very, very disappointed initially at Toy Show. Half of our customers didn't want to buy the thing. And uh, so I was telling Ruth, see, I told you, you know. But as soon as it got on the counter, I was wrong, she was right. <laughs> The mothers and children bought those dolls and those clothing so fast that uh, they made, the co consumer made the Barbie doll an instant success. Mattel sold 351,000 Barbie dolls in 1959, and by 1963 there were over 2 million Barbie dolls sold. And Ruth Handler had become one of the biggest most successful toy executives in the industry, and she was also the only woman executive in the industry. Who run the world? Ruth Handler. <laughs> a little side note here, a little tangent. A man called Jack Ryan, who originally worked developing missiles, but who now in our story worked for Mattel, helped Ruth create the original design for the Barbie doll. Jack Ryan was a little bit wild <laughs> and would frequently host massive parties with all sorts of substances at his massive house that was built to look like a castle. He also drove around in a fire truck. He lived in a 36-room Hollywood castle and he designed a softer, more pliable body, a doll that's nicer to hold. His beach parties featured Barbie-like ladies in fantasy costumes. Here he's carrying two guests along the beach. Was Jack as crazy a person as one gets the impression he was? Yes. <laughs> he had lots of fun and we had lots of fun. It was a fun atmosphere. Ruth and Jack would later get into a dispute about who was responsible for the Barbie doll's design. Jack's relationship with Mattel soured, and in 1980 he sued Mattel for royalties, and the company settled out of court. After all of this, Jack unfortunately unalived himself in 1991. Meanwhile, Barbara, Ruth's daughter, didn't like the Barbie doll. She found it embarrassing that the doll was named after her, and she resented her mother for not being around or available as much as the other kids' mothers at the time. And this really upset Ruth. I didn't know they were naming a doll after me until suddenly the doll was out and named, and everybody was coming up to me about it. She was very confused. She had very mixed emotions. 
<laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> I really didn't like it at the beginning because I couldn't adjust to it. But you at one time made me quit calling you Barbie. But they clearly reconciled later on in life because later Barbara would speak very highly of Ruth in interviews. Ruth's son, Kenneth, also resented having a doll named after him. Apparently, the kids at school would bully him because the doll had nothing between his legs. Kids can be so mean. Ruth also said that she struggled being a woman in the male-dominated world of business. But she was very good at standing her ground and holding her own, eventually getting a reputation for being a strong and quite ruthless leader. <laughs> ruthless? Ruth? Ruth is ruthless. Anyway. Do the guys treat you as another guy? They don't know how to treat me. They're very mixed up about me. <laughs> <laughs> She's mentioned in interviews that men would often feel quite unsure around her and would not know how to behave, but she would use their confusion to her advantage during negotiations and meetings. She mentioned that she once had a meeting with a man and he told her afterwards that he was expecting her to behave like a man. Sitting back, wearing a suit, holding a cigar. But Ruth actually found this quite upsetting because she still wanted to be seen as feminine even if she was a savvy businesswoman. She said it was always really important for her to retain her femininity even in a male-dominated work environment. Which I think is reflected very well in the Barbie doll. People often underestimate Barbie's intelligence and power because she's feminine. But in actuality, Barbie is a brilliant example of how people can be both. By the late 1960s, Mattel had more women executives than any other toy company. And this was definitely down to Ruth's influence. The 1970s were not an easy decade for Ruth and the rest of Mattel. In 1970, Ruth Handler was diagnosed with breast cancer. She had a mastectomy, but struggled to find a good prosthetic breast. This took a great toll on her confidence. I had had a mastectomy in 1970 and I'd lost my self-esteem. I'd lost my self-confidence and I found that I was no longer the uh, confident uh, executive. And I found that I, my leadership skills had wavered. And uh, it just was a very awful time in my life. And I was about as low as one can get. Meanwhile, the growing feminist movement had led to many people criticizing Barbie's appearance, saying that Barbie's proportions and beauty ideals were unrealistic and damaging. This criticism is something that would follow Barbie and she would have to face pretty much up until today. Ruth doesn't often comment on the Barbie backlash other than to applaud her for her accomplishments in areas which historically had been considered not for women. Many women have a problem with their own bodies as they grow older. I cannot believe that the doll causes that. In the beginning, Barbie just seemed to be consumed with what she was wearing, just clothes. Connie, the whole concept of Barbie was that her clothing would permit the child to pretend they were in a certain kind of activity. The oil crisis also made production of the dolls difficult, and so cost-cutting measures were taken. In 1972, Mattel reported $30 million loss, and Mattel's stock had hit an all-time low. In 1974, the SEC charged Mattel with fraud. Ruth Handler was named as one of the Mattel executives that had purposefully hidden embarrassingly low sales figures to protect Mattel's stock price from falling any lower. In 1975, Ruth Handler resigned from Mattel, somewhat reluctantly. A year later, Ruth and four other Mattel executives were indicted. Ruth pled no contest. The judge sentenced her to 41 years in prison but later suspended the sentence in exchange for a fine of $57,000 and 2,500 hours of community service. Ruth maintained that the allegations of fraud were an accident, but things started to look up for Ruth. In 1976, she started a new business called Nearly Me. Ruth developed the Nearly Me brand of breast prosthesis in response to a growing need for more comfortable, realistic, and durable breast forms for the post-mastectomy market. 
They were designed by men, obviously, who didn't have to wear the damn things. And besides that, they didn't match the other side. The two sides just didn't match. Losing a breast is not the end of the world, ladies and gentlemen. Ruth had always felt quite isolated from other women because of her interest in business. But when starting her breast company, she spent a lot more time talking to women and relating to women. And she grew to really appreciate and respect women and her new female friends. She also said in an interview that she had never really considered herself a feminist, but she definitely does now and realized that she always had been one. Ruth had gone from fighting for a fictional woman to have breasts to fighting for real women to have breasts. Ruth even said herself, somehow my life has revolved entirely around breasts. And Ruth as always was great at promoting the new product. I want you to feel. Yeah. Suppose they're tuning in right now. <laughs> she named her new company Roofton Corp. So after all these years, Ruth finally had a company named after her. In 1989, Ruth unfortunately lost the other breast to cancer. And in 1991, she sold the brand Nearly Me. But she would continue to spend a couple weeks a year promoting the product because she said it was the work that meant the most to her. Understandable, but poor Barbie. <laughs> I knew that if I was going to make, you know, make an issue of the whole subject of breast cancer, I may as well do it right. Millionaire inventor Barbie doll says, to know the consumer's needs and make it cheaper and better. Women at the top. Double success. After retiring from Mattel, Ruth Handler launched another successful company manufacturing artificial breasts for cancer. In 1994, Kenneth Handler, Ruth's son, sadly passed away at only 50 years old. Ruth publicly announced that the cause of this was a brain tumour, but it was later revealed that he in fact died of AIDS complications. He had come out to his parents in 1990 and acknowledged his diagnosis, but he was married to a woman at the time and they had three kids together. Ruth's ambition and constant need to prove herself would ultimately make it hard for her to ever really consider herself a success. Which is ironic because Barbie is one of the most successful toys in the world, and she's also a vision of perfection. Do you think today that you have proved yourself? That's a hard question to answer. I, I guess so. I get the feeling that you cannot declare success. Well, uh, I've had a lot of uh, bad things happen. And so, uh, you got me. Can you stop this for a minute? I don't know what happened to me. This is a woman who does not cry easily. The problem with me is the extremes are so great. The heights are so high and the depths are so low. And there have been more lows in recent years. In June, her son Ken died of a brain disease at age 50. And for 25 years, Ruth Handler has been fighting breast cancer. You obviously realize the irony of creating Barbie and insisting that she have breasts. Yes and the fact that uh, you have the loss of your own. Yeah, it is ironic. Somehow my life has evolved around breasts, purely by accident, I'm sure. Ruth Handler passed away in California from complications during surgery for colon cancer on April 27th, 2002. She was 85 years old. She was buried next to her son. Her husband, Elliot, passed away nine years later at the age of 95. Ruth Handler was a trailblazing businesswoman. And just like Barbie, she was an unstoppable force. You are successful. I know that. I know that. Over and over and over again, people said to me, thank you for making my life better. On one or two occasions, they told me they were nearly me wearers, and that I understood. Uh, I don't want to put Barbie down. Uh, I am learning that she is far more important than I could have ever myself understood. It thrills me to walk into an uh, airport and see a child carrying her Barbie doll or be in uh, an assemblage of people and have a child playing with her Barbie. Uh, it's a great thrill. Uh, I. I'm humbled by the whole thought that we could have had that much influence. Uh, 
and yet I know that we did. There we go, doll fans. That was the history of Ruth Handler, the creator of Barbie. Let me know what you thought of Ruth Handler's story. Also, don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to my channel if you're new here. And don't forget to check me out on Instagram and TikTok and check out some more of my videos, of course. <laughs> and I will see you really soon. Bye. <laughs>